Section 16 of Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Samantha Miles. Hans Christian Andersen Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848 to 1853 by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. The Story of the Year It was near the end of January, and a terrible fall of snow was pelting down and whirling through the streets and lanes. The windows were plastered with snow on the outside. Snow fell in masses from the roofs. Everyone seemed in a great hurry. They ran, they flew, fell into each other's arms, holding fast for a moment as long as they could stand safely. Coaches and horses looked as if they had been frosted with sugar. The footmen stood with their backs against the carriages, so as to turn their faces from the wind. The foot-passengers kept within the shelter of the carriages, which could only move slowly on in the deep snow. At last the storm abated, and a narrow path was swept clean in front of the houses, when two persons met in this path they stood still, for neither liked to take the first step on one side into the deep snow to let the other pass him. There they stood, silent and motionless, till at last, as if by tacit consent, they each sacrificed a leg and buried it in the deep snow. Towards evening the weather became calm. The sky, cleared from the snow, looked more lofty and transparent while the stars shone with new brightness and purity. The frozen snow crackled underfoot, and was quite firm enough to bear the sparrows, who hopped upon it in the morning dawn. They searched for food in the path which had been swept, but there was very little for them, and they were terribly cold. "'Tweet, tweet,' said one to another. "'They call this a new year, but I think it is worse than the last. We might just as well have kept the old year. I'm quite unhappy.' and I have a right to be so. Yes, you have, and yet the people ran about and fired off guns to usher in the new year, said a little shivering sparrow. They threw things against the doors, and were quite beside themselves with joy, because the old year disappeared. I was glad, too, for I expected we should have some warm days, but my hopes have come to nothing. It freezes harder than ever. I think mankind have made a mistake in reckoning time. "'That they have,' said a third, an old sparrow with a white pole. "'They have something they call a calendar. "'It's an invention of their own, "'and everything must be arranged according to it. "'But it won't do. "'When spring comes, then the year begins. "'It is the voice of nature, and I reckon by that.' "'But when will spring come?' asked the others. "'It will come when the stork returns, but he is very uncertain.' and here in the town no one knows anything about it. In the country they have more knowledge. Shall we fly away and wait? We shall be nearer to spring then, certainly. That may be all very well, said another sparrow, who had been hopping about for a long time, chirping, but not saying anything of consequence. But I have found a few comforts here in town, which I'm afraid I should miss out in the country. Here in this neighborhood there lives a family of people who have been so sensible as to place three or four flower-pots against the wall in the courtyard, so that the openings are all turned inward, and the bottom of each points outward. In the latter a hole has been cut large enough for me to fly in and out. I and my husband have built a nest in one of these pots, and all our young ones, who have now flown away, were brought up there. The people who live there, of course, made the whole arrangement that they might have the pleasure of seeing us, or they would not have done it. It pleased them also to strew bread-crumbs for us, and so we have food, and may consider ourselves provided for. So I think my husband and I will stay where we are, although we are not very happy, but we shall stay. And we will fly into the country, said the others, to see if spring is coming. And away they flew. In the country it was really winter, a few degrees colder than in the town. The sharp winds blew over the snow-covered fields. The farmer, wrapped in warm clothing, 
sat in his sleigh, and beat his arms across his chest to keep off the cold. The whip lay on his lap. The horses ran till they smoked. The snow crackled, the sparrows hopped about in the wheel ruts, and shivered, crying, Tweet, tweet, when will spring come? It is very long in coming. Very long indeed, sounded over the field, from the nearest snow-covered hill. It might have been the echo which people heard, or perhaps the words of that wonderful old man, who sat high on a heap of snow, regardless of wind or weather. He was all in white, he had on a peasant's coarse white coat of frieze. He had long white hair, a pale face, and large clear blue eyes. "'Who is that old man?' asked the sparrows. "'I know who he is,' said an old raven, who sat on the fence, and was condescending enough to acknowledge that we are all equal in the sight of heaven, even as little birds, and therefore he talked with the sparrows, and gave them the information they wanted. "'I know who the old man is,' he said. "'It is winter, the old man of last year. He is not dead yet, as the calendar says, but acts as guardian to little Prince Spring who is coming. Winter rules here still. Ugh! The cold makes you shiver, little ones, does it not?' "'There! Did I not tell you so?' said the smallest of the sparrows. "'The calendar is only an invention of man, and is not arranged according to nature. They should leave these things to us. We are created so much more clever than they are.' One week passed, and then another. The forest looked dark. The hard, frozen lake lay like a sheet of lead. The mountains had disappeared, for over the land hung damp, icy mists. Large black crows flew about in silence. It was as if nature slept. At length a sunbeam glided over the lake, and it shone like burnished silver. But the snow on the fields and the hills did not glitter as before. The white form of winter sat there still, with his on-wandering gaze fixed on the south. He did not perceive that the snowy carpet seemed to sink as it were into the earth, that here and there a little green patch of grass appeared, and that these patches were covered with sparrows. Tweet, tweet! Is spring coming at last? Spring! How the cry resounded over field and meadow, and through the dark brown woods, where the fresh green moss still gleamed on the trunks of the trees! and from the south came the two first storks flying through the air, and on the back of each sat a lovely little child, a boy and a girl. They greeted the earth with a kiss, and wherever they placed their feet white flowers sprung up from beneath the snow. Hand in hand they approached the old ice-man, Winter, embraced him and clung to his breast, and as they did so, in a moment all three were enveloped in a thick, damp mist, dark and heavy, that closed over them like a veil. The wind arose with mighty rustling tone, and cleared away the mist. Then the sun shone out warmly. Winter had vanished away, and the beautiful children of spring sat on the throne of the year. "'This is really a new year,' cried all the sparrows. "'Now we shall get our rights, and have some return for what we suffered in winter.' Wherever the two children wandered, green buds burst forth on bush and tree. The grass grew higher, and the cornfields became lovely and delicate green. The little maiden strewed flowers in her path. She held her apron before her. It was full of flowers. It was as if they sprung into life there, for the more she scattered around her, the more flowers did her apron contain. Eagerly she showered snowy blossoms over apple and peach trees, so that they stood in full beauty before even their green leaves had burst from the bud. Then the boy and the girl clapped their hands, and troops of birds came flying by, no one knew from whence, and they all twittered and chirped, singing, "'Spring has come!' How beautiful everything was! Many an old dame came forth from her door into the sunshine, and shuffled about with great delight, glancing at the golden flowers which glittered everywhere in the fields, as they used to do in her young days. The world grew young again to her, as she said, It is a blessed time out here today. The forest already wore its dress of dark green buds. The thyme blossomed in fresh fragrance. Primroses and anemones sprung forth, and violets bloomed in the shade, 
while every blade of grass was full of strength and sap. Who could resist sitting down on such a beautiful carpet? And then the young children of spring seated themselves, holding each other's hands, and sang and laughed and grew. A gentle rain fell upon them from the sky, but they did not notice it, for the raindrops were their own tears of joy. They kissed each other and were betrothed, and in the same moment the buds of the trees unfolded, and when the sun rose the forest was green. Hand in hand the two wandered beneath the fresh pendant canopy of foliage, where the sun's rays gleamed through the opening of the shade, in changing and varied colors. The delicate young leaves filled the air with refreshing odor. Merrily rippled the clear brooks and rivulets between the green, velvety rushes, and over the many-colored pebbles beneath. All nature spoke of abundance and plenty. The cuckoo sang, and the lark caroled, for it was now beautiful spring. The careful willows had, however, covered their blossoms with woolly gloves, and this carefulness is rather tedious. Days and weeks went by, and the heat increased. Warm air waved the corn as it grew golden in the sun. The white northern lily spread its large green leaves over the glossy mirror of the woodland lake, and the fishes sought the shadows beneath them. In a sheltered part of the wood the sun shone upon the walls of a farmhouse, brightening the blooming roses and ripening the black juicy berries which hung on the loaded cherry-trees with his hot beams. Here sat the lovely wife of summer, the same whom we have seen as a child and a bride. Her eyes were fixed on dark gathering clouds, which in wavy outlines of black and indigo were piling themselves up like mountains, higher and higher. They came from every side, always increasing like a rising rolling sea. Then they swooped towards the forest, where every sound had been silenced as if by magic, every breath hushed, every bird mute. All nature stood still in grave suspense. But in the lanes and the highways, passengers on foot or in carriages were hurrying to find a place of shelter. Then came a flash of light, as if the sun had rushed forth from the sky, flaming, burning, all-devouring, and darkness returned amid a rolling crash of thunder. The rain poured down in streams. Now there was darkness, then blinding light, now thrilling silence, then deafening din. The young brown reeds on the moor waved to and fro in feathery billows. The forest boughs were hidden in a watery mist. And still light and darkness followed each other. Still came the silence after the roar, while the corn and the blades of grass lay beaten down and swamped, so that it seemed impossible they could ever raise themselves again. But after a while the rain began to fall gently, the sun's rays pierced the clouds, and the water-drops glittered like pearls on leaf and stem. The birds sang, the fishes leapt up to the surface of the water, the gnats danced in the sunshine, and yonder, on a rock by the heaving salt sea, sat Summer himself, a strong man with sturdy limbs and long dripping hair. Strengthened by the cool bath, he sat in the warm sunshine, while all around him renewed nature bloomed strong, luxuriant, and beautiful. It was summer, warm, lovely summer. Sweet and pleasant was the fragrance wafted from the clover field, where the bees swarmed round the ruined tower, the bramble twined itself over the old altar, which, washed by the rain, glittered in the sunshine, and thither flew the queen bee with her swarm, and prepared wax and honey. But Summer and his bosom wife saw it with different eyes. To them the altar table was covered with the offerings of nature. The evening sky shone like gold, no church dome could ever gleam so brightly, and between the golden evening and the blushing morning there was moonlight. It was indeed summer. And days and weeks passed, the bright skies of the reapers glittered in the cornfields, the branches of the apple trees bent low heavy with the red and golden fruit. The hop, hanging in clusters, filled the air with sweet fragrance, and beneath the hazel bushes, where the nuts hung in great bunches, rested a man and a woman, Summer and his grave consort. "'See,' she exclaimed, "'what wealth, what blessings surround us! Everything is homelike and good, and yet I know not why. I long for rest and peace.' 
I can scarcely express what I feel. They are already ploughing the fields again. More and more the people wish for gain. See, the storks are flocking together, and following the plough at a short distance. They are the birds from Egypt, who carried us through the air. Do you remember how we came as children to this land of the north? We brought with us flowers and bright sunshine, and green to the forests. But the wind has been rough with them, and they are now become dark and brown, like the trees of the south, but they do not, like them, bear golden fruit. "'Do you wish to see golden fruit?' said the man. "'Then rejoice!' and he lifted his arm. The leaves of the forest put on colours of red and gold, and bright tints covered the woodlands. The rose-bushes gleamed with scarlet hips, and the branches of the elder trees hung down with the weight of the full, dark berries. The wild chestnuts fell ripe from their dark green shells, and in the forest the violets bloomed for the second time. But the queen of the year became more and more silent and pale. "'Blows cold,' she said, "'and night brings the damp mist. I long for the land of my childhood.' Then she saw the storks fly away every one, and she stretched out her hands towards them. She looked at the empty nests. In one of them grew a long-stalked cornflower, in another the yellow mustard seed, as if the nest had been placed there only for its comfort and protection, and the sparrows were flying round them all. "'Treat! Where has the master of the nest gone?' cried one. "'I suppose he could not bear it when the wind blew, and therefore he has left this country. I wish him a pleasant journey.' The forest leaves became more and more yellow, leaf after leaf fell and the stormy winds of autumn howled. The year was now far advanced, and upon the fallen yellow leaves lay the queen of the year, looking up with mild eyes at a gleaming star, and her husband stood by her. A gust of wind swept through the foliage, and the leaves fell in a shower. The summer queen was gone, but a butterfly, the last of the year, flew through the cold air. Damp fogs came, icy winds blew, and the long dark nights of winter approached. The ruler of the year appeared with hair white as snow, but he knew it not. He thought snowflakes falling from the sky covered his head, as they decked the green fields with a thin white covering of snow. And then the church bells rang out for Christmas time. The bells are ringing for the new-born year, said the ruler. Soon will a new ruler and his bride be born and I shall go to rest with my wife in yonder light-giving star. In the fresh green fir-wood, where the snow lay all around, stood the angel of Christmas, and consecrated the young trees that were to adorn his feast. May there be joy in the rooms, and under the green boughs, said the old ruler of the year. In a few weeks he had become a very old man, with hair as white as snow. My resting time draws near, the young pair of the year will soon claim my crown and scepter. But the night is still thine, said the angel of Christmas, for power, but not for rest. Let the snow lie warmly upon the tender seed. Learn to endure the thought that another is worshipped whilst thou art still Lord. Learn to endure being forgotten while yet thou livest. The hour of thy freedom will come when spring appears. "'And when will spring come?' asked Winter. "'It will come when the stork returns.' "'And with white locks and snowy beard, "'cold, bent, and hoary, "'but strong as the wintry storm, "'and firm as the ice, "'old Winter sat on the snow-drift-covered hill, "'looking towards the south, "'where Winter had sat before, and gazed. "'The ice glittered, the snow crackled, the skaters skimmed over the polished surface of the lakes. Ravens and crows formed a pleasing contrast to the white ground, and not a breath of wind stirred, and in the still air old winter clenched his fists, and the ice lay fathoms deep between the lands. Then came the sparrows again out of the town, and asked, "'Who is that old man?' The raven sat there still, or it might be his son, which is the same thing, and he said to them, it is winter, old man of the former year. He is not dead, as the calendar says, but he is guardian to the spring, which is coming. 
"'When will spring come?' asked the sparrows. "'For we shall have better times then, and a better rule. "'The old times are worth nothing.' "'And in quiet thought old winter looked at the leafless forest, "'where the graceful form and bends of each tree and branch could be seen. "'And while winter slept, icy mists came from the clouds, "'and the ruler dreamt of his youthful days and of his manhood, "'and in the morning dawn the whole forest glittered with hoar-frost, which the sun shook from the branches, and this was the summer dream of winter. "'When will spring come?' asked the sparrows. "'Spring!' Again the echo sounded from the hills on which the snow lay. The sunshine became warmer, the snow melted, and the birds twittered. "'Spring is coming!' And high in the air flew the first stork, and the second followed. A lovely child sat on the back of each, and they sank down on the open field kissed the earth and kissed the quiet old man and as the mist from the mountain top he vanished away and disappeared and the story of the year was finished this is all very fine no doubt said the sparrows and it is very beautiful but it is not according to the calendar therefore it must be all wrong end of the story of the year Recording by Samantha Miles.